Okay, can somebody confirm that you can hear me? I can hear you. Great. I guess you can't see my screen yet, but uh, give me just a minute here. All right, you should be able to see my screen now. So today is January 19th, come on. And we are supposed to be talking about chapter three and hopefully we'll finish the, uh, the uh, lesson today. Any questions? All right, I got a lot of uh, email. I have not looked at it yet. I just saw that when I opened my page to launch the uh, uh, Zoom session. Uh, if there's no questions, let's move on. I don't think there's anything I need to talk about. I guess I can say that uh, I did do a fair amount of grading and the last Two labs were graded. What the heck were those? Maybe labs two and three, as well as the last uh, worksheet for the lecture, which I think was on chapter two. So for the labs, you have until Saturday to update your answers. If you did not get a perfect score, 100%. Remember, if I give you a 0 0.01, that is not your score for a lab. That is a key that lets me know that I need to go into this assignment and see if students have uploaded a... Um, well, an upload with the correct answers, and then we'll regrade it. So that is not your score. That's just a key to tell me to go in there and check and see if you've supplied um, correct answers. And you'll always have, well, about a week. Uh, you have one week from when you turn it in. Uh, when I grade it and then submit it, you will have maybe five days to upload make corrections and upload your uh, correct answers. All right, any questions about any of that? So let me remind you for uh, chapter three, besides the, um, the, what's that called? The objectives, and the study notes are in the study guide here. I need to break that into two different files. I haven't done that yet, but it's one file and the, the objectives are before the study notes for chapter three. And then there's the uh, worksheet, which will be due this Saturday. And then I've already talked about the optional quizzes. You can take a optional quiz. Remember, if you go into these, pages unless you copy the link. If you open it, it won't open in Canvas. It'll open a page like this and it won't actually even display in Canvas. You need to click on this link up here. So you have to click twice to get to it. And then it opens it in a tab outside of Canvas. And this will run outside of Canvas. It doesn't run in Canvas. I'm not sure what's going on. That might be just something the Canvas has to protect it. That stuff running outside of Canvas won't really run in Canvas. And then there's an extra study group. You can get together an extra credit assignment. You can get together with some other students to study. And you need to do some things to do that, but uh, essentially study for half an hour. You, you should be ideally quizzing yourself on something that you may be quizzed on in this class. 
You have to do that for half an hour. Uh, you do not have to quiz yourself. But you do need to study, though. It cannot be working on your lab. I'm not going to give you credit for your lab worksheet and then credit for the extra study group. So if you turn in your lab, uh, you're not going to get the credit for the um, extra credit study group. And then one person in the group needs to submit a document, including your full name and the full names of everyone in your group. Tell me when you studied, the date, what you studied, and for how long you studied. And you'll get one point. Okay. All right. Uh, you can get together over the phone. Uh, you can get together in person. You can get together in Zoom or some other program. All right, let's move on to chapter three. We had been talking about the light microscope, and I told you that uh, the compound microscope is one that has two magnification lenses. The objective lens, which rotates, and there's more of them, uh, between 4x and 100x on our scopes. And then the ocular lens, which most Compound microscopes have a 10x magnification in the ocular lens, but some compound microscopes have a 20x lens. You need to know all of the parts that are listed in this diagram for a microscope. I suppose the body tube, you don't need to know, but you know to know everything else. A simple microscope, on the other hand, only has one magnification lens. And a simple microscope in, is, in a sense, all it is is a powerful magnifying glass. And this is actually a simple microscope made by Anton van Leeuwenhoek. Uh, you can buy more complex and up-to-date modern simple microscopes today, but this is a uh, one that he made himself when microscopes were just recently being made, fairly recent, within 100 years or so. When you're talking about the microscopes, you do need to know what resolution is. Resolution is the ability of the lenses to distinguish two points as separate points. For example, the zero and the two, hopefully for all of you, can be distinguished as two separate points. In fact, you can probably see the zero, the point, and the two. Microscopes have a resolving power of 0 0.2 micrometers. So they can distinguish two points that are separated by 0 0.2 micrometers apart. The limit depends on the properties of white light. So this is the best resolution that a microscope can get. And that is a, a resolution of 0 0.2 micrometers where two points can be distinguished as two separate points. That's 200 nanometers. The best compound light microscope can magnify 2000 times I think I already mentioned this, and that's 100x in the objective lens and 20x in the ocular lens. Any further magnification would not do any good because 2,000 times uh, gets to this resolution of 0 0.2 micrometers. Is that clear? If you had like 4,000 times magnification, which is theoretically possible, you could have an ocular lens of 40x and an objective lens of 100x. It's theoretically possible. You could make a uh, microscope by, 
by that, but the resolution would not be any better than 0 0.02 micrometers because of the properties of light. The further magnification wouldn't do anything. Let me show you another example of resolution. So here we're looking at these structures under the scope, and you can tell from this that these two points are two distinct points, which are these two here. Um, this will be like under the electron microscope and this will be under the, uh, the light microscope. So you can distinguish these two points and this is exactly 200 nanometers apart. That's the best resolution you can get using white light. And on the other hand, all of these points here all blur together and you can't really distinguish one from the other. You can maybe just barely make that one out because that's close to 200 nanometers. Any questions about resolution? With the microscope, you have refraction. Refraction is when light bends when it's going through a medium. And light bends whenever it moves through a medium, comes out of the medium, and then goes through another medium. So here, actually we have three mediums, but we're only gonna talk about two, because we're only seeing two. And that is light is moving through the air, and light is moving through the water. Those are two different media, and light will bend at the change of the medium. We say light refracts. Why the pencil looks bent is because the light is bending. And this is what the thing looks like. The pencil is straight, then it hits the water, and so it looks like the pencil is breaking. And it's not, obviously, it's a straight pencil. Um, it's just that the properties of light are bending at the change of the medium. Any question about any of that? So the refractive index is the light bending ability of the medium and the light bends and when you, the light leaves the medium. Why we use oil is because oil has the same refractive index as glass. And so on a slide, whoops, let's come back to this. I, I sort of forgot about that. When we're looking at the light going through the slide, if there is no oil here, let me blow that up. On the right side, there's no oil, at least my right side. Um, and light goes through the glass and right at the interface of the glass and the air, the light bends, okay? If you have instead oil between the glass and the glass of the lens of the objective lens, then the light will not bend when it's leaving the glass. And that means when we have no oil on this side, some of the light will come through the glass and it won't refract and it'll be sent directly up to the lens. So that light is captured. Some of the light will bend, but not enough that uh, it misses the lens. And so it will be captured by the lens. And you'll notice that that light is actually bending twice. This ray is bending when it comes out of the glass and enters the air. And it's bending when it leaves the air and comes into the glass of the objective lens. The point is this ray and that ray is captured by the lens. This ray comes out of the glass and is refracted. And this ray is refracted enough that it misses being captured by the lens. And then of course, you'll notice there's another um, ray and it's refracted so strongly that it, uh, is not even going to enter the air, at least not on this side of the glass. So if you use oil here, none of the light rays 
refract when they leave the glass. So that one, of course, is the same because it's just hitting the, it's not refracted, okay? This ray is not refracted and it's gaining by the lens. This ray is not refracted either because it's going through the oil and it is captured by the lens. So that means more of the rays are captured by the lens when you have oil between the glass and the microscope. And that improves the resolution because more of the light is captured by the lens of the microscope. And that ray is not refracted because it's in the oil, but uh, it's not captured by the lens. Same as that one. So therefore, immersion oil reduces, or in this case, removes the refraction of light. So more light is captured by the lens, and that improves the resolution of the scope. Any question about that? All right, let's go back to why is the refraction of light important? Uh, when a bird's eye is seeing a fish in the water. When the fish is down here, light is refracted. So that to the bird's eye, it looks like the fish is in this location, but in reality, the fish is in this location. It's just that the light is being refracted at the surface of the water and the air, okay? So this is important for fish, not fish, for birds. It is important for fish too, but for birds, and that is when they're going to capture the fish, they need to know that the fish isn't at this location. It's actually in this location. Okay. Any question about that? I guess the point is, is the refraction of light is important for life, and that is the bird has to compensate and the bird knows that this is where it's seeing the fish, but it knows the fish is down deeper. And so it's got to put its feet down deeper. All right, if there's no questions, let's move on to uh, light microscopes and say that most microscopes and all of the microscopes in our lab are light microscopes, but they are of the type bright field illumination, where the object looks dark compared to the background, which is just where the light is coming through the, the glass of the slide. And when you look at that, let's blow that up. Actually, let me see if I can blow it up here. So we have the light coming out of the light source and it comes through the condenser lens and then it's put on a cone of light. Come on, my mouse died. Cone of light coming through the specimen and then the uh, light will be refracted from the specimen and the glass slide and the uh, lens will capture some of that light and then we'll see our specimen and the specimen will look fairly dark and then the background will be very light from the light passing through the slide. Any questions about that? This we call bright field illumination. It differs from dark field illumination where we have light coming out of a source and then we have a disc blocking the light from directly coming from the light source to the specimen. But some of the light at an angle misses the disc and then hits the specimen and the light is refracted. And some of that light refracts back into the lens. Let's see if I can get rid of that. So it's captured by the scope and then we can see it. And if we see it, it'll look like a fairly dark image, 
but the image is brighter than the background. The background is dark because all the light coming from the source is blocked by the disk. So that's why the background looks uh, dark. And then the light uh, from the angle uh, comes through and it's bent because the direct light is going to hit the disk. But the, the light that's at an angle and then hits the specimen and then is bent, some of that can be collected by the lens by refraction. It just happens to go into the lens. Because the direct light with no refraction would be blocked by the disk. And then that gives rise to dark field illumination where the background is dark and the object is fairly dark, but it's much lighter than the background. And this is called dark field illumination. Any questions about any of that? All right, so the light microscope differs from an electron microscope. And here we're seeing an actual electron microscope. The first thing to note about it is it's much bigger than a light microscope. An electron microscope uses a beam of electrons that are focused on the specimen. They are not focused by a glass lens, but they are focused by an electromagnetic lens. An electromagnetic lens bends the electrons, which have a charge, towards uh, being captured by the lens of the electron microscope, which isn't a normal objective lens. The wavelength of electrons is much shorter than the wavelength of light. So you have a wavelength of light and a wavelength of electrons, and the wavelength of electrons is about 100,000 times shorter. You don't need to know that, the number, but that's why we can get greater resolution with an electron microscope. In fact, what we can do is get the resolution uh, up to 100,000 times greater than the resolution of a light microscope. When we examine a specimen under the electron microscope, we can do it by two main types, meaning there's two main types of electron microscopes. And you do need to know these two main types. There are two other types, but they are just ones we'll just mention in passing. You don't need to know the other two of the four types for the quizzes. The first main type of an electron microscope is transmission electron microscope, which we're seeing here. And the second is a scanning electron microscope seen here. Any question about any of that? Well, you'll notice some differences here. First, the transmission electron microscope is two-dimensional. You're only seeing two dimensions, not three dimensions. And with transmission electron microscopy, you can see structures inside the cell although it's only a 2D scan. So it would be about this thick through the specimen. Everything's on one plane. That differs from scanning electron microscopy. And with scanning electron microscopy, you're seeing the surface of the object, meaning you can see the surface of this cell, I think. And uh, you can see that it's in three dimensions, not two dimensions. Any questions about any of that? So once again, um, scanning electron microscope, you're only looking at the surface of the object but you can see the object in three dimensions, meaning you can see that this is the very top and it then goes down in the depth and 
you can see down to nearly the bottom of the, the uh, I don't know, crystal or whatever that is. Any questions about any of that? All right, transmission electron microscopy sees inside the cell, but it's only a two-dimensional image. And you can see if this scan, I think that's of a chloroplast, but this is the membrane. And uh, you can see inside the cell, not just the surface, you can't see inside the crystal, for example, but uh, um, the scan is only in two dimensions. It's not in three dimensions. Any question about any of that? All right. There are two other types of electron microscopes. You're not going to be examined on them. So I'm just going to mention the third type of electron microscope. It's called scanning tunneling microscopy. It uses a metal probe to scan a specimen. And like I said, you don't need to know this. I'm not going to quiz you on that. The fourth type of an electron microscope, which you're also not going to be examined on, is atomic force microscopy. It uses a metal diamond probe inserted into the specimen. And this one shows a three-dimensional image. When you're looking at this toxin from Clostridium perfringens, you can see it has three dimensions. Any question about any of that? All right, let me remind you, you don't need to know any of this for the quiz. Uh, the, the two later parts of the electron microscope. The two, two later types, I guess I should say. But you do need to know the uh, uh, scanning electron microscope and the uh, um, transmission electron microscope. All right, if there's no questions, let me ask you a question. Which of these cells are easier to view? The cells on the left panel or the cells on the right panel? In the right. Yes. The only difference between the cells in the left and the cells in the right are the cells in the right have been stained with a dye. And these cells are much easier to see than these cells. These cells, the cells are nearly transparent. That's why they're not showing up well. So with a bright field light microscope, most microbes appear colorless and have little contrast with the slide or the medium shown here. That is, the slide is also transparent to light, and the cells are mostly transparent to light. So it's hard to see them because there's little contrast between the background of the cell, which is the slide, and the specimen, which is the bacteria. To see them, we really need to stain them. It is possible to use a special microscope like a phase contrast microscope to see the cells, but I'm not going to talk about a phase contrast microscope. If you're interested, you can read about it. Staining is just coloring the specimen or coloring the background to increase the visibility and the contrast. Everyone get that? Staining either colors the specimen or it colors the background to the specimen. Both increase the visibility and increase the contrast between the specimen and its background. Before you stain, you make a smear. So a smear or a bacterial smear is a thin film of bacteria on a slide. You make a bacterial smear prior to your staining. Usually the microbes in the smear are air dried 
and heat fixed to the slide. This will attach the bacteria as well as it'll kill many of them. Meaning if you were to put E. coli on a slide, air dry the E. coli, and then heat fix the bacteria to the slide, that will kill E. coli. E. coli is fairly sensitive, both to air drying and to uh, heat fixing. And that's why the bacteria will be killed. This is generally a good thing because if you're going to be working with bacteria, you don't want to get the bacteria on yourself or inside yourself, in which case it would make you sick. It does not kill all cells, like for example, an endospore. Uh, air drying and heat fixing wouldn't do anything to an endospore. So when we stain a microbial smear, we use dyes and dyes are called stains. And so these two words are used interchangeably. The stain will be a salt consisting of a positive and negative ion. Remember we mentioned that a salt is a molecule that breaks apart into two one part has a positive charge, another has a negative charge. And usually when this happens, uh, it's a complete charge, meaning uh, one side of the equation, I don't have it here, but we have a compound and then you break it. Uh, a compound, which is a stain, I guess I should say, and then it breaks apart into uh, two parts, one will be a positive ion, the other a negative ion. Whatever side of the molecule that breaks into two, a positive ion and a negative ion, whichever side is colored, we call that side the chromophore, the colored part of the dye meaning the dye will break into two when it's dissolved in water. And probably what will happen is something very small will come off, like maybe sodium, sodium chloride ion. And the other part will be the rest of the dye. If the dye that has the, meaning the portion of the dye that has the colored part has a positive charge, we call it a cation, and this cation is a basic dye. So a basic dye is one where the positive part of the molecule is the colored part of the molecule. On the other hand, an acidic dye is when the colored part of the molecule has a negative charge or an anion. Everyone get that? A basic dye is a dye that when you add it to water will break into two and the part that colors has a positive charge. For an acidic dye, we put the dye into water, the dye breaks apart into two parts. The one that has the negative charge is the one that makes the acidic dye. Any question about any of that? Hopefully that was clear. I'm not sure I'm making sense here. Bacteria have a slightly negative charge. Therefore, basic dyes stain the cell better because a positive cation, which is the chromophere, which is the part of the dye, that does the actual coloring will bind to the cell by the positive charge binding or being attracted to the negative cell. So bacteria have a slightly negative charge. Some basic dyes include very common dyes we use in microbiology, crystal violet, methylene blue, malachite green, and saffronin. And I think I've mentioned everyone maybe but the methylene blue.
and an acidic dye typically stains the background of the cell, but does not stain the microbes. It has a negative charge, the acidic dye, and so it will be repulsed from bacteria which have a slightly negative charge. Some common acidic dyes include eosin, nigrosin, which we have not talked about, and fuchsin, which I think we talked about carbol uh, fuchsin, which is probably similar to fuchsin. Staining the background and instead of the cell is called negative staining. We've talked about what a negative stain is and we used it to see the cell capsule. But uh, uh, when you stain the background of the cell instead of the cell, it's called negative staining. And this term derives from the old photographs which produced a negative. And the negative was in black and white which isn't what we're going to see here, but, but uh, uh, it has to do with that. So when we look at a sample using a basic stain, it'll look like the sample on the left, meaning the cells uh, are darkly colored. And the background may not be colored. In this case, it's lightly colored because not all of the background rinsed away. I mean, not all of the basic dye when we rinse the slide went away. Some of the dye is retained very little bit. And so that's why the background has a slight pinkish color. A negative stain on the other hand will look like this where the background is stained and the cell is not stained. Any questions about any of that? All right, so there are three main types of stains. There's a simple stain, a differential stain, and then special stains. A simple stain I've already talked about, and that's uh, one using a basic or an acidic dye. So one stain is a simple stain, and it can be acidic or basic. Uh, I think the lab manual mentioned that it had only, or maybe the textbook only had one basic stain, and that's not correct. A negative stain, if you're only using one, it is called the simple stain. A differential stain usually uses two or more dyes. And when we use the differential stain, we're trying to differentiate between two different cell types. And then a special stain, stains specific, uh, what do you call it, structures, specific structures in a cell. And those special stains are developed to highlight that structure, whatever it's supposed to be staining. I'm gonna shrink that a little. There we go. So a simple stain is either an aqueous, meaning a water-based or an alcohol-based solution containing a single dye, and that shouldn't be basic. So let me erase that. The primary purpose of the simple stain is just to increase the contrast between the background of the slide and the specimen. The stain is applied to a fixed smear, meaning you make a fixed smear first, let it air dry, heat fix it, and then you can stain it. You do it for a certain length of time. Uh, after that, you dump off the dye. The uh, cells are usually washed gently with cold water. The slide is then dried with pipulous paper and then you can examine it. A mordant, 
may be used whenever you're using a dye. A mordant is a, an ingredient that intensifies the stain. So in functions of a mordant is, it is not a stain. It simply enhances the first stain, not the mordant. The mordant may increase the affinity between the stain and the specimen, making the specimen more likely to be stained. And then the mordant may coat the specimen to enhance it, thereby making it easier to see by increasing it. Like in the flagella stain, what you do is you put several layers on top of the flagella, and then you can see the flagella under the flagella stain, which you would not have seen under the, um, under the gram stain. So this is a flagella stain, and it simply coats the flagella. So then we can see the flagella in the light microscope. Normally, you do not see the flagella in the light microscope. I'm trying to remember if I've ever seen the flagella in a live specimen. And I don't think I have. I have seen when a boy in high school is getting ready for football and they put something on to make them stand out. I don't know what I'm getting at for that. <laughs> I lost my train of thought there, but it's similar. And that is the flagella stain coats the flagella and usually put on several coats. And then the flagella will show under the light microscope because normally you cannot see the flagella when you're using a light microscope. It just doesn't show up. Uh, it's too transparent. It doesn't take in the gram stain, for example, either of the parts of the gram stain. And uh, it just doesn't stain. So you need to use a, a mordant to make it visible. All right, a differential stain is a stain that reacts differently with different kinds of microbes. So it can distinguish between two types of cells. Usually a differential stain uses two or more dyes, but that is not required. If you have one dye that can differentiate two different cells, and for example, let's say it takes two different colors with two different species of bacteria, that would be a differential stain if it's used uh, to look at the differences between the two types of cells. The most commonly used differential stains are the gram stain and the acid fast stain. Both of these stains use two different dyes to stain the cells. The Graham stain was developed by Hans Christian Graham. You don't need to know the year that he developed it, but you should know that it's named after Dr. Graham. And so whenever you use the Graham stain, you should capitalize the G in Graham. It turned out to be a very useful stain in bacteriology because it could classify bacteria into two very large groups the gram-positive bacteria, and the gram-negative bacteria. And here we're looking at a gram stain where the one cell, the cocci, stains gram-positively, and then the longer rods, uh, bacilli, uh, stain pinkish under the gram stain. And they have differences and the gram stain is using those differences to make the gram stain appear different between the two different types of cells. All right, let's briefly go through the gram stain. 
you make a bacterial smear first on a glass slide, let it air dry, let it heat fix. You must do the air drying and the heat fixing. Otherwise, the bacteria will wash off the slide simply in the washing steps of the gram stain. You then flood the uh, slide with crystal violet, leave it on for one minute, 60 seconds, to stain all of the cells. You then uh, dump the dye off and wash the cells with cold water. You then flood the cells with iodine or mordant, and you let it sit for 60 seconds. Uh, in my passageway, everything is 60 seconds, except for the decolorization step. Okay, after staining with crystal violet, you then wash the uh, dye off with cold water, gently do that. And then you flood with iodine and mordant for 60, cents, uh, 60 seconds or one minute. When you're done, you dump off the iodine and then wash the cells again with uh, the cold water. Then you flood the slide with the decolorizing agent. Many of the decolorizing agents are acetone with ethanol, although you can see different decolorizing agents. Uh, the most different is where you're using one decolorizing agent like ethanol and uh, if you're only using ethanol, you need to uh, decolorize for longer period of time than you would if you're using ethanol acetone mixture or ethanol acid mixture. All right, after, well, I haven't talked about decolorizing. Uh, decolorizing, the best way to do that is to get your slide. Get your decolorizing agent, put it on uh, the slide, let it run down the slide. And when the blue or the purple of the crystal violet iodine complex comes out of the cell and stops running, meaning no more is coming out, you stop adding the decolorizing agent. And this is done in about five seconds. You then wash immediately the slide with cold water because the Decolorizing agent that is left on the cells after pouring it off will be enough to continue to work and continue to pull the dye out of the cells. So if you have the decolorizing agent on too long, it will pull the decolor the agent, decolorization agent out of the cells even though they should not have been pulled out. For example, if you apply the decolorizing agent and you use too much and too long, you will pull the crystal violet iodine out of the gram-positive cells as well as the gram-negative cells. And you do not, in this case, want to pull the crystal violet out of the gram-positive cells because these cells are gram-positive. You then flood the slide with safranin. It's the counter stain because it's the second stain used and it will stain the cells pink. The safranin goes everywhere, including on the gram positive cells, but it'll stain the gram negative cells pink. And you leave that for about one minute. You can leave it as far as two minutes. Um, if the safranin is really weak, you'd want to put it on for two minutes. You then dump the safranin off, wash the slide with dry, uh, cold water, blot the slide dry with bibulous paper, and then you can examine it under the microscope. And after blotting, there will be so little water there that you can actually put oil on and view the specimen before the slide totally dries from coming out of the pond. All right, any question about any of that?
All right, let's go through this in a little more detail. So on the gram stain, first we add the crystal violet, and you can notice that all of the cells, the gram positive and the gram negative, stain purple. We then apply the iodine, the mordant, and all that does is it binds to the crystal violet in the cells. That will make the cells look a little darker and they will be a little more purple purple. Uh, usually the crystal violet is a bluish purple or you can say a blue color. And then when you add the mordant, it will be more of a purple purple color. You then add the decolorizing agent and if applied correctly, it will decolorize the gram negative cells so these cells will look clear after adding the decolorizing agent. The gram positive cells will not be decolorized if you use the decolorizing agent correctly. And so they will retain the purple color from the crystal violet iodine complex in them. You then flood the cell with safranin, and that will change the clear gram-negative cells to a pinkish gram-negative cell. Any question about any of that? All right. So let's go through that in even more great detail. Uh, you do need to know the different colors, by the way, of the of the steps of the gram stain. You actually have a question on that uh, in the lab. All right, so first you stain with crystal violet, staining for 60 seconds. Crystal violet sticks to the peptidoglycan in the bacterial cell wall. So all the cells will stain purple or blue purple. From uh, the stain, crystal violet is considered the primary stain since it's coloring all cells and it's the first stain that's used. So the gram positive cells will appear purple, the gram negative cells will appear purple. We then apply iodine after a water wash. And let me state that when you're going through the steps of the gram stain, you don't need to put a wash step in every time you wash the cells. What you need to just do is put at the end or at the beginning that at each step you do a wash with cold water. You just need that in there one time. So I think I already mentioned the gram positive cells will look purple or blue purple. The gram negative cells will have the same color. You then apply the iodine. Iodine will increase the affinity of the crystal violet for the specimen. It'll actually complex with the crystal violet, making it uh, a larger molecule. So iodine is considered a mordant in this case. You apply for 60 seconds, and the color of both the gram positive and gram negative cells will be the same, and they will be a purple color. It is true this will be a darker and more purple purple color than the crystal violet alone, but it's still purple. You then do the uh, decolorizing agent. And that's usually an acetone ethanol wash, but it doesn't have to be. Like I said, it could be an acid ethanol wash, or it could be just a straight ethanol wash. You don't need to know what the decolorizing agent has to be, but for this example, we're giving acetone and ethanol. It washes the crystal violet out of the gram negative cells, but not out of the gram positive cells, as long as you do it correctly, meaning you do not overwash and you do not underwash. This step is considered the differential step in the gram stain because the cells will look different after this step. 
the gram positive cells will appear purple in color. The gram negative cells will be colorless in color after the wash, uh, not the wash step, the decolorizing step. All right, then you uh, uh, take off the decolorizing agent and quickly wash it with cold water. And then you add safranin to the slide. Safranin is a pink dye. Safranin does get in all the bacteria. So it does get in the gram positive cells and the gram negative cells. It is a counter stain because it has a different color to the primary stain, the crystal violet. And it's the second uh, stain that's used. There was a question there. something all right can you ask the question again the mic cut out okay what question oh i thought you said there was a question there ah <laughs> uh, somebody i thought was talking so i thought they had a question but i'm not sure what it was because i didn't hear what they said and it looks like they're not going to add it so maybe i answered it what their question was um After staining with safranin, the gram positive cells will stain purple and the gram negative cells will stain pink. You then uh, take the slide and uh, dump the safranin off, rinse gently with cold water, and then you blot the slide dry in bibulous paper. Did I ever show you how you do bibulous paper? You take it out, put it in the, the slide in between, and then you blot it down. I don't know if you can see this. You just press down on the paper. You do not take the slide and where the cells are and rub it on the bibulous paper. That will remove the cells. But if you just blot it, that will remove the water or enough of it so that then you can see the cells under the microscope, even if you use oil. All right, before I go here, let me go back here. And I did mention that when we add sephronin, it does stain all the bacteria. So why? are the gram negative cells appearing pink and the gram positive cells are appearing purple. If I just told you the safranin does stain all of the bacteria. Why isn't it a pink color, the gram positive cells, or at least a purple pink color? Can anyone answer that? Okay. The gram, the gram positive cells have picked up the crystal violet stain, and the gram negative cells were colorless in the previous step, so they pick up the pink safranin stain. Okay, but the the pink dye, the safranin, is going in the gram positive cells. My question is, why aren't the gram positive appearing at least a little pinkish to us? Well, the purple stain's pretty strong, right? Yeah, that's exactly it. The purple stain is strong and our human eye cannot see the pink over the purple color. If we were to look at the cell uh, under an electron microscope at high magnification, we would see in regions of the cell that there would be a purple color in the cell, the gram positive, and in other places of the gram positive cell, we would see a pink color. We'll put it here, okay? But to our human eye, it only looks purple, okay? So that's why this, the gram positives look purple because to our human eye, we're seeing the purple. The pink is overshadowed by the purple. So we don't notice the pink and we'd have to go 
in an electron microscopic image to see the pink in the gram positive cells. Is that clear? Sort of? That makes sense. Okay, good. All right, I talked about that. So the gram positive cells are purple. The gram negative cells are pink after the gram stain. And what is the basis of the differential staining? The basis is the differences in the cell wall structure. Gram positive bacteria have a thick layer of peptidoglycan. We'll talk about what peptidoglycan is in our next lesson. It's a disaccharide and has uh, short chains of amino acids in it. But that thick layer of peptidoglycan traps the crystal violet iodine complex and it is not washed off if we do the decolorizing step correctly for only about five seconds. The gram-negative bacteria do have a layer of peptidoglycan, but it's much thinner. And it is not thick enough to retain the crystal violet iodine complex. The gram-negative cells also have a lipopolysaccharide layer, which is called the outer membrane of the cell wall. And the, uh, the uh, uh, ethanol, as well as maybe the acetone uh, of the decolorizing step will destroy that lipopolysaccharide layer. So when we're looking at the gram-positive cell, there it is. The cell wall looks like this, very thick purple layer, and then a yellow layer, which is the cell membrane underneath it. And if we blow that up further, it's many layers of peptidoglycan. This picture is only showing you three, but in reality, it's many. And don't ask me what the minimum of many is, but it, let's say it's around 100 or more layers of peptidoglycan. And uh, I guess the one way to show it is that this layer is one layer, this layer is another layer, that layer is another layer. The gram-negative cells do have peptidoglycan in them, but it's much thinner. It also has the cell membrane on one side, which are lipids. And then on the outer side of the gram negative cell, we also have another lipid layer. And when we blow that up, let me see if I can blow this up a little more. So it looks like this. This is showing you the peptidoglycan is one layer thick. It's not one layer. It too has several layers but it's less than many layers. So it's much thinner than the gram-positive cell. The peptidoglycan, I don't know how many layers it is, but it's not just one layer. It's, it's several layers, but it's much fewer than the gram-positive cells. And then there's the outer membrane of the cell wall. And as you can see, that's a lipid layer. And that lipid layer will get destroyed by the um, acetone alcohol wash, or even just an alcohol wash. It will dissolve the lipids. So this thin layer does not retain the crystal violet iodine complex, but the thicker layer does. Any question about any of that? All right, this is just uh, telling you that the crystal violet and the iodine form a complex. And the crystal violet iodine complex is larger than the crystal violet or the iodine alone. It's telling you the 
gram negative cells have a thin peptidoglycan layer and that the uh, uh, decolorizing step washes the crystalviolite iodine out. So the cells are colorless at this point of the gram negative cells. Gram positive cells have a thicker peptidoglycan layer and the crystal violet iodine com complex is not washed out as long as you do the decolorization step correctly. So the cells will appear purple after this step. And then this is looking at the gram stain, different cells. We have a gram positive rod, a gram negative rod, a gram negative spirochete, a gram I think that's gram positive. This one here for sure is gram positive cocci. Oh, and then uh, I did say a gram negative spirochete. I don't see any gram negative cocci, but uh, there is a gram positive cocci right there. When you're doing the gram stain, sometimes it can look like this. And how do you read that? When you have uh, bad sections of the slide. These are actually uh, crystals of crystal violet. You read the slide in the good portions of the slide. You don't read it in the bad portions of the slide. So you do it where it's easy to see the cells and the cells are staying correctly. Let me see if I can blow this up a little. Going up even further. Right in here, you can kind of see it, and a little bit here. And it's a little visible here. And that is, these cells are darker purple than those cells. Oh, right here is a good place, too. See how these cells are darker than these cells here? What's happening is these cells in this region are closer to the crystal of crystal violet, meaning this crystal is not in solution. It's actually a crystal of crystal violet. And typically, the cells close to the crystal will be darker in color. It's like the crystal violet from the crystal is coming out and coloring these cells. And so they will be darker in color than the cells further away. Now, this looks like it's a gram positive cell. So there really isn't that much difference between these cells and these cells, but on a gram negative cell, these cells out here could be pink and these cells in here could be purple. The point is you don't wanna read the slide in a bad region, which would be where the crystal is. You wanna read the slide in a good region of the, the slide, such as this region of the slide. Any question about that? Would any amount of um, decolorization get rid of all of that staining or lighten it? Uh, not entirely. It might. Oh, where did I go? I'm trying to make that a little smaller. I still need to make it smaller. It would help on a small crystal, but a large crystal, you're not going to ever get it all off. Because this is a solid. The crystal violet is supposed to be a liquid in the dye, but sometimes it starts forming crystals of crystal violet, and this person just happened to get them. Usually in the bottle, bottom of the bottle, you will get crystals of crystal violet. And then at the top, hopefully you don't have any crystals of crystal violet. So no, you can't totally avoid that. Although if you use the top of the solution, you shouldn't have problems with that. The uh, gram stain is not always as clear cut as I presented it. For one thing, you have to have young growing bacteria, bacteria that are less than two days old. Anything older than that, uh, you may get inconsistent results in your gram stain. Some bacteria cells stain poorly if they stain at all from crystal violet. 
And this is usually the mycobacteria. And what happens is they have mycolic acid in their cell wall. The mycolic acid prevents water and anything that's dissolved in water, like crystal violet and safranin, from getting in the cell. So the mycobacteria stain poorly. They do stain, just they don't stain as intensely, meaning as darkly as uh, other cells. And that the gram stain will not be as completely straightforward as you would hope it would be, will become apparent to you when you work on your unknown project, where you might be pulling out your hair because the results are not always consistent. But like I stated, the most important thing is to make sure you have freshly growing cells and use those cells for doing the gram stain because the gram stain may not work if you're using it on old cells. All right, the structure of gram positive and gram negative cells not only affects the staining, it also affects other properties of the cells. For example, uh, how well the cell responds to antibiotics. Gram positive bacteria tend to be easily killed by penicillin G, as well as cephalosporin and many detergents. The gram negative bacteria, on the other hand, tend to be resistant to penicillin G, cephalosporin, and some detergents. What happens is the gram negative cell has an outer membrane on the cell wall, and that outer membrane prevents penicillin G from getting into the cell and then killing the cell. And like I said, it's that lipopolysaccharide layer of the outer membrane, and it just prevents the molecule like a penicillin G, cephalosporin, some detergents from getting inside and then killing the cell. Any questions about any of that? All right, if not, that's it for the uh, differential stain. Let's quickly talk about the special stains. You're not gonna be examined on the special stains. However, you do need to understand the capsule stain because you may be using it for your unknown lab project. The capsule stain is a stain that is used to stain the capsules. Normally, in a staining procedure, the procedure will be too rough and that will wash away the capsule. And then when you stain the cells, you will not see the capsule. But the capsule stain can show you the capsule. Uh, one capsule stain is a negative stain and it colors the background of the slide and it colors the uh, cell itself but it does not stain the capsule. So these, I don't know, halos or clear regions around the cell is a capsule around the bacteria, which the bacteria actually makes. Uh, this is my favorite negative stain or a capsule stain, and it's using India ink. And I think I once told you this says it's India ink, but I can tell it's not because uh, the cells were staining too darkly. This sample is India ink, and you can see that India ink stains the background very darkly because India ink is black, and it lightly stains the cells. They're not quite as dark as the background. It does not stain the capsule. And this is exactly why they call it a negative stain. As you can see, it's dark and light, the same as a film negative. 
Any questions about stains, capsule stains, gram stains, any other? All right, if there's no further questions, I'm gonna end it here and I will see you at 6.30 for the lab. Bye.